All right. Nope. Ow. Son of a bitch. <laughs> the wrist. Ow. Okay, never mind. Ow. What's going on, you guys? It's your Huggable Hipster here, and welcome back to the Hunter's Cafe. Today, I am graced, should I say? That is the right word. Graced to be in the presence of Quelag. How are you? Me, I'm good. I'm going to be eating while we talk. So apologies for any mouth noises or like food imagery. I know that that can be, can it can give people the ick a lot. A dark, so. dark Souls ASMR, maybe? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hamburger <laughs> ASMR, yeah. So she's been on YouTube for 12 years, took a bit of a hiatus and came back a year later, kind of like how From Software does, where they come in just out of nowhere in the community. <laughs> they just grace us with their presence. And then what thing I want to make absolutely clear to you guys is that she is the one who is absolutely responsible for the Lore 3 Thursdays on Thursday that you guys see all the time on Twitter. So thank you for those, by the way. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, and she also does production in game and media. So if you see any of her stuff, she probably did that. Uh, I wanted to just say a big thank you to her taking the time out to do the podcast. So really, truly, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So today we're going to get into all sorts of stuff. We're going to get into lore. We're going to get into some Gamergate stuff. It'll just be a hodgepodge of different topics, but mostly the lore, which I'm really, really excited about. So there was actually one piece of lore I wanted to talk to you about because I found, I, I didn't necessarily find out about it, but I had a thought about it. And I wanted to know if it was something that was already in the community, if it was something common, the lore theory about Patches being a time traveler. Yeah, we could talk about that. I'm totally down to to break into that because that's, that's something that I think falls into the uh, more like interpretive aspects of like from soft lore and i totally w me and like my my followers have talked about that like ad nauseum so i can, oh, I can break that open. <laughs> okay so because i did a video on this i think this was like a year or so ago i didn't know if it was already a theory or not and i always preface any theory videos that i do if, if this is a theory please mention them down in the comments below so we can discuss it give them proper credit all that kind of stuff um, I did mention in the video that in Demon Souls, Patches says, who else is going to kick you down a hole? And I think, wait, is he, does that mean that he is a time traveler from the other games, considering the fact that if he's kicking you down a hole and he even knows that in Demon Souls, which came before Dark Souls 1, then that's the only thing, because I don't have anything, unfortunately, else to back up my theory besides that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So Patches is um, associated with a lot of like works that Miyazaki specifically is like the lead director on. So even though Sekiro, for example, like Miyazaki kicked that project off, off he wasn't like the main director on that project. Um, so a lot of people noted that there's like an absence of Patches, but that there's a new character that kind of like takes his place archetype wise. Um, but Patches has been in Miyazaki's game since Armored Core 4. So Patches was a pilot of a mech in Armored Core. And um, obviously there's some like similarities between a lot of like Miyazaki's connected games, like in terms of like the tropes or like the archetypes that he uses. So we always have like, you know, like a big tree, like the world tree where um, there's like a flame inside of it or like a law inside of it, like the law of the world. There's always um, scholars that are like associated with soul arts and like moons and kind of like the blue, like color theory, like the mana color theory. And then there's always like holy people that are more associated with like the sun and faith. Um, so there's like these archetypes and patches, I feel like is kind of this archetype that is kind of like a fourth wall breaking direct representation of like Miyazaki's creative hand yeah. in a way. Like it's kind of like Miyazaki writing like I'm here, but in character form because it, it shows like anything that he's had direct um, direction or like, I guess like governance over. Also, sorry, my words are going to be totally scrambled today because we just got done doing like a four hour stream. So, um, but yeah, anything that he directly directed, you're going to see patches in it. Um, I'm I'm like I'm trying to remember if Patches made an appearance in Armor Core Six or I know Armor Core Six was also the Sekiro director, if I'm not mistaken. Um, no, it's interesting that you say that because a lot of people wouldn't consider Armor Core a Souls game. I know that whenever I talk with Fighting Cowboy on the same thing, he's like, "No, it's not a Souls game whatsoever." No. <laughs> because it's so interesting that he kind of like leaves his imprint and his mark as kind of like a signature almost to be like, like you said, like I'm here, you know. Yeah, I think it depends on like 
what and and that was like a whole conversation that was kind of like floating around Twitter for a hot minute and I spoke on it as well where I do consider Armor Core 4 to be the blueprint for Demon Souls. I think that Miyazaki did take a lot of in-game philosophy from his work on Armor Core 4. Um, a lot of the weight distribution, the controller layout, the UX and UI. So like, you know, obviously at the time, a lot of action games were um, face button, like you use the face buttons like Kingdom Hearts or Devil May Cry, you use the face buttons to attack, to jump, to, to do everything. But um, Armored Core, because of like the controller limitations, utilize the shoulder buttons in order to dictate the left side of your mech and the right side of your mech. And then it was also utilizing Z targeting, which was something that was quite complicated at the time to incorporate into games. And FromSoft, after their work on Armor Core 4, actually got um, contracted, I think, to do some of the Z targeting work in, I want to say, the Gundam Unicorn game that came out for PlayStation 3. Um, I'm going to have to like double check that. So if people in the comments, if you're watching this right now, please, please double check it. But um the the main things i definitely think the the controller like ux the the way that like you control your character and you kind of feel like the left hand like the left half of the controller dictates like the left side of your character or your mech's body and the right side is the right side of your body okay. the z targeting is the same but instead of like the only difference between Demon Souls and Armored Core is obviously you have a Z plane, so your character is able to fly and move around. Um, but for the most part, the targeting system worked the same. So a lot of that technology was like that technology and that UX, like that user experience, wasn't as commonplace as it as it is now. I would say Demon Souls and Dark Souls really paved the way for a lot of that, like. Z target. I would say Zelda, obviously the Zelda series like was the one that started that kind of like targeting system. Um, but you know, you kind of see it across like all these different games, but a lot of people don't remember what it was like during that point in gaming history. Like they almost forget that that wasn't a commonplace thing. Like no, you, it wasn't. you almost never saw shoulder button action games. So <laughs> no. Um, Especially, they, like, if you remember, like, the Scooby-Doo Night of a Thousand <laughs> Frights game on the GameCube, that primarily mm -hmm. only used the main button controls, never the shoulder controls, to jump, to move, to crouch, whatever it was. Yeah, most action games, I felt like at the time, did that. But I think a lot of people, when they think of a Souls-like game, they think of the art, the atmosphere, the design, and they don't necessarily think about, like, the mechanics so much. But for me, for me, it was um, from, like a, like, a designer perspective like game design, I, I think that there's like this divorce between aesthetics and like the framework of a game. And like, I definitely saw the framework of Armored Core manifesting in Demon's Souls. I think also another thing, um, I forgot if I mentioned it, weight distribution and repairing was like a huge component of Armored Core. Um, and like more, so, it was it was huge in Demon's Souls. And I know that y'all who have ever been attacked by a scraping spear, you can straight up like get your build bankrupt. In that game because repair costs cost so much um so you would have to go and like grind to try to repair your equipment but all of your equipment would be broken so it'd be hard to grind to repair it so it was this like endless cycle but it, it that kind of mimics armored core in a lot of ways because you're mech you can go into debt um but yeah that kind of like cost of upkeeping your equipment also gets taken over from armored core into demon souls interesting yeah because i've never played an armor core game the current one that i'm Excuse me, about to review right now is the newest armor core that came out. So I don't know if it has the same uh, uh, mechanics as the other ones did, but I'm interested to see if Patches is going to be in this one. <laughs> oh, it's not. So the director on that was Yamamura, who I believe was the um, game designer for Sekiro. And Patches is not in it, but the Great Sword of Moonlight is. And the Great Sword of Moonlight is kind of like that equivalent of... Um, so say, for example, Patches represents um, Miyazaki's creative hand. The Great Sword of Moonlight represents FromSoft as like a company as a whole. Um, so if you ever see Moonlight Blade, you know, any moon related weapon, you'll see it across like all of their IPs from Kingsfield to Armored Core to Dark Souls and Demon Souls. But um, the way that I think that my community views it and that I've kind of view it is not that there's like a direct interconnected multiverse between Demon Souls and Dark Souls, because what happens is like Miyazaki will take existing characters or existing concepts and like iterate on them and slightly change them or tweak them. 
And like those new iterations are kind of him refining his work. So in Dark Souls, for example, we have, or in Demon Souls, we have the King in Yellow or the, the old monk who exists in the Tower of Latria. And there is an old story by Robert Chambers about like a, an emperor who exists over a kingdom. And the kingdom has like arcane secrets, like magic secrets. And um, Miyazaki's taking this work and he's putting it into his own and it's about a monk in Latria. But then we also get the same robe and the same king in yellow in Dark Souls 1, but this time his name is different and the um, kingdom that he rules over isn't Latria, it's Ulysseal. So it's a different place. And then in um, Dark Souls 3, this happens again. So like he's just kind of reiterating and like recycling ideas um he also like reuses assets between games and like reiterates on certain boss designs but like i don't think it's there there was a conversation loki and i had about like is this lazy game design and like i would actually argue no but that's like a whole other conversation that i could get into <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily lazy. I think it's the fact of the matter that it's just keeping a consistent storyline. Because when you look at different, you know, UXs and UIs being used, even in Zelda games, you know, I know people were complaining about that for the new Zelda game versus Breath of the Wild, that there were different areas being reused. And I would think that that for the player base, it's a source of familiarity in the story and where they're located. So it, it you know, there is a basis to say that it is a form of just keeping sameness for the player. Um, I know that there was another theory that this is how I actually started to interact with you on the theory of Solaire. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh my God, I felt like, I actually felt kind of proud of myself. I didn't know it was already an existing theory on Solaire actually be, not dying at all whatsoever, but being the, um, the dung eater. And I thought it was really interesting because when I went into Elden Ring for one of the bosses, it was at the time I was taking on Radon, I think like three weeks ago. And I finally beat him. I went back because I've got one of the parts that you need for Dung Eater's storyline. And I go to see him. I'm like, wait a second, there's like a sun on his chest. What's going on here? And I looked at Solaire's and I was like, why is this the same? Why is he reminding me of Solaire? What, what if he was actually the one who didn't make it out. He went insane and he turned into a dung eater. And I wanted to get more of your thoughts on that because I know we had a brief discussion about it on Twitter and you sent me that lovely hat of Solaire, which by the way, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the dung eater and like the sun in this circumstance is something that I feel like Miyazaki's changed and he's iterated on. And so the sun in Dark Souls represents something very different than the sun in Elden Ring and the guidance of grace in Elden Ring, which is really cool to see like how he's refined it. I do think too that Solaire and the Dung Eater can like I think if you look at it that way, like you have somebody that is looking for guidance or is looking for sun or is looking for light and ends up, you know, like becoming depraved or disillusioned or like hollowed for lack of a better word, because they can't achieve what they set out to achieve. Um <clears throat> I would say that there's some like there's ways in which they align. I do think Dung Eater is representing something that actually is like more of a concept in, in Buddhism, which is like, I've, this is like a whole thing that I've gone down with like a bunch of um, my followers, but there's this idea of um, people who experience suffering, which the Dung Eater has. Um, and he's trying to like, I guess like, reconcile that suffering by causing suffering onto others um and kind of the same vein that moog is it's almost like accepting your your like sense of revenge or your sense of like i i want to you know but dung eater takes it a step further where he says if if i'm cursed and if anybody with horns is cursed then everybody should have the seedbed curse so that way everybody's cursed so then that way nobody is like seen as is as bad because we're all going to be bad and i feel like that's a very different it's a very different story and journey than like what solaire has where solaire is just trying to like connect with his faith and connect with his find his like guiding light find his son and then like it, you know it's kind of up to the player whether or not he like ends up finding it but i don't I, it's almost like I don't see that sense of optimism with the dung eater or maybe that is optimism maybe cursing everybody is optimism <laughs> um but it, it's it's definitely like a little bit of a journey. I do think that sun symbol, um, it actually comes from 
real world art, that symbol that Miyazaki used for Solaire's tabard, the emblem, um, it comes from a picture of the firmament. I told, okay, it's firmament, firmament engraving the uh, flammarion engraving. Who did this though? Uh, by an unknown artist. Oh, great. Fantastic. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and, um, it appears in Camille Flammarion's 1888 book. And for those of you to see the picture that she's talking about, it'll be I'll right over here. Yeah, so, I'm going to send yeah. it over um, Discord. Wait, where's the... Hold on one sec. Okay, here we go. Um, and the firmament's actually referenced like a few times in the Soulsborne games, and it's it's actually like hidden in Elden Ring underneath the dial on the clock. If you remove it, my community actually, like if you have to go into the game files to do this, but if you remove it, you can actually find artwork underneath the clock. Well, it's weird because it's like some of the assets that I found um, that like I've I've talked about, like the black obelisk that is down in like the Undercities. Um, and then Tarnished Archaeologist is another person who clocks a lot. Um, they clocked the tablet uh, the Mesopotamian tablet that depicts Babylon um, that's, like, resting at the feet of that, like, bearded man in the Undercities, in the Ula ruins. So there's a lot of, like, Mesopotamian artifacts, but, like, what FromSoft likes to do is they like to scan real-world artifacts and put them in their games, and it's become more of a thing since Bloodborne. Um, I wouldn't say... There was, like, a couple times where they did that in, like, Dark Souls, but it was very one-off, and it didn't have any lore relevance. But it kind of seems like it's more of a thing now um where they're really like nailing down using real world real world history and kind of using that to like inform their historical fiction i really like that that, that adds so much substance it's like a book but it's a video game to a degree i think that's pretty awesome but to go back to your point of where you were talking about the dung eater and to say that like if you're you know if you have fully sinned or if i have sinned everyone else needs to be sinned it could be taking on more of a religious aspect as well with the concept of original sin yeah the it's weird because the omen curse is like i wouldn't i don't know if it's um i think i know we're gonna get more answers in the dlc so this is all speculation right now. Um, but the Omen Curse is... There's definitely aspects of the Crucible relating to the Omen. And I, I also am curious about the Dung Eater in general because he believes that he's Omen, even though he doesn't have physical horns on his skin. But he's like a part of the same crop, if you will. Like, yeah, And I don't exactly. know why he thinks this. I Like... I'm kind of curious to see if we're going to get a little bit of um, information regarding why he why he's come to this conclusion because we do have evidence of like the fire giants in the DLC and the fire giant war and we also have evidence of like crucible era stuff which is more of like the era of animal worship and also the era where things like horns, wings and like uh, tails are all seen as like holy figures or like holy aspects. Um, but then when Radagon takes over and it becomes like fundamentalist golden order, all of those things then get like demonized and outlawed. But then for some reason, at some point in history, and I'm not quite sure if it's like when Destin Death is healed, um, Omenborn start to like pop up. And it's like, I, I've, I've talked with Loki about whether or not we think it's like a modern thing or a thing that like has happened before. But um, Loki's under the impression that it is like a, a modern occurrence that happens in fundamentalist the fundamentalist order where like babies are being born with horns but i feel like i feel like this was something that happened a long time ago and is like a normal thing to happen but i think that it signifies the tree's end or like the end of an era and that these babies that are being born with horns are supposed to signify like potentially like the new tree or like a new era but that's like my own crackpot theory that, there's like the only evidence yeah. that i have of that is like the ancestral followers and that's it that's all you i see, got the interesting part about that theory is that that kind of goes back to dark souls one two and three of the rekindling the fire of where there were new beings being brought into the world and new things being brought into what the story is and it kind of goes into actually the next theory that i saw floating around which i thought was interesting um because when you said that it was like oh gosh that's like the new rekindling of the fire like you have these beings that are being brought in like Vogue 
for example, right? You have the marriage between him and Makilla. And that's why I was kind of intrigued by whenever you go into the boss battle with him, you see Makilla in the egg, so to speak, of where <laughs> it looks like she's almost being reborn to an extent. Yeah, like, so when you go fight Melania, there's actually like the figure that's a giant tree. It's like a tree person. Um, when you enter Melania's boss room and there's like a hole where there should be like a womb, there's like a, a big pit. And I definitely think the egg, given the fact that the egg is resting on a pelvis, um, I definitely think that the egg used to sit in there and then Moog infiltrated the Halig tree and like stole Mikola away and brought him down into the Undercities. But a lot of people, there's like discourse in the community around this right now. Like people think that Mikola intentionally tried to get Moog to kidnap him. I'm not of that understanding. Like I definitely think Mikola was trying to achieve something with that big tree body. Um, specifically i think that there's this like idea of a ruler needing to sacrifice themselves to become the tree in order to like kind of like there's like there's like a degree of mart martyrdom that i think is like associated with being a ruler or like having like an age or an era once again given the ancestral follower lore i feel like they inform like so much of my theories <laughs> so they're very important but yeah um I find yeah, it very interesting too because it's just like you, like you said, it kind of comes all full circle when you think about it because you have one thing that affects another thing. It's a catalyst for another thing, and it's all linked to everything else. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's like very that's very intentional um, by Miyazaki, and it's like kind of brilliant game design that we have all these different factions that are all interconnected because then that way when a DLC comes out or you know when something happens and everything has like a cause and effect it makes sure like there's kind of like a guarantee that a lot of those factions will be represented in items so for example like if you're a dragon crucible person and you are hoping for more dragon crucible like dragon incantations sorry dragon incantations person and you're hoping for more dragon covenant stuff i am sure we're going to get it like if you're a um, necromancer player and you you like like the death rancor stuff i'm sure we're gonna get it because everything is kind of all interconnected so it allows for them to then like create more stuff every time they iterate on the story so yeah, i don't know exactly. if that makes sense <laughs> no it does it absolutely does and it actually goes to the next uh lore thing that i want to go to of where what happens when the first flame truly dies because i saw this one piece of lore floating around of where it, when it's fully extinguished, we had this one bit at the end of Dark Souls 1 where, uh, excuse my paraphrasing, but Gwyn, and I wrote this down, Gwyn trembled at the coming age, and the nature of man is supposed to be dark and unforgiving, and it's supposed to be something of where we don't know what's going to happen, so it's like the age of humanity was, I feel like, the dark age. But do you want to go into, like, what you think of what would happen yeah. if the first flame would, like, truly extinguish? Because that's what I feel like Dark Souls 4 would be, would be the full extinguishing of that first flame. Yeah, so the flame has been extinguished, like, multiple times throughout the game series, and then a new cycle begins. So Dark Souls 2 is, like, cool in this sense because it allows us to get a good understanding of what happens to boss souls when a new world is created. So, for example, we see all the different ways in which people have been reincarnated into, like, different entities. So we have, like, the death of this one world, it's completely gone, but then all of this, like, soul fire, like, this willpower or this sense of identity then gets, like, transmutated and becomes something new. And it seems like at the end of every cycle you know, death happens and like darkness happens and, and things kind of cease to exist and then they start to pop up again. And so it kind of is like a repeating cycle. A lot of people, um, you know, equate it to alchemy and like the alchemical process where it's like, that's a repeating cycle. But then a lot of people also equate it to like Eastern philosophy, where a lot of that is about repeating cycles, like cycles of suffering or um, uh, I think that like it serves I, I definitely think it's very metaphysical. Like, I think darkness is like a an, an age or an era without consciousness or without conscious thought. I think it's not something that's supposed to be discernible by, like, someone who is, like, awake. I think that with the Age of Fire, we get, like, language, we get 
you know, stories, we get souls and all this other stuff. And then dark, it's almost like consciousness like ceases. And then we get back to, uh, you know, like a new flame, a new ruler, a new pygmy, a new, you know, like that cycle repeats. But we see it also in Elden Ring too. Yeah, which I thought was interesting when we get into the uh, the fruit of pygmy. That's by far, I think, one of the most interesting characters of the entire franchise because it's cloaked in mystery. And until you like see the items and you see their descriptions and you see everything throughout the game, you start to piece together who the fruit of uh, who, if I can talk right now, who the fruit <laughs> of pygmy actually was. Mm -hmm. And in that, for me at least, my theory on that is that it's actually the only human in the game. Like the hollow isn't the human, the you know the the tarnished isn't the human. It's actually the fruit of pygmy, because we needed like that human catalyst to become what the hollow, in in essence, would be. Like you needed that soul and you needed that kind of darkness within, mm -hmm. or else you can't have an age of fire without humanity to bring it forth. You need to have something to like, kind of bring it down to the earth in a sense. Yeah. So do you think that like the, the hollowed and like the people with the dark sign are like, um, fragments or like pieces of, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I could see it. I, especially because of how Nishandra dark souls too, and like all the different shards of manis that just kind of get sprinkled everywhere. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Because when I see Nishandra's character, especially within the dark souls too, that was interesting to see that she was kind of like this shell of herself to a degree. And then mm. as you see more of her lore and as you see her as like the final boss battle, it was so relevatory. When I was seeing Nishandra's boss battle, it instantly was kind of like an epiphany moment because you have Gwyn, you have Nishandra, you have all of these different choices that you can make except in dark souls too. Did you notice that before the Scholar of the First Sin came out, it only had the one ending. In Dark Souls 1, you have two endings or three, I think you can choose from. In Dark Souls 4, you have four, no, Dark Souls 3, Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's no Dark Souls 4 yet, don't do that, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> in Dark Souls 3, you had four endings that you can choose from. And in Elden Ring, you have a multitude of endings. So mm -hmm. I wonder why it is that when you have a choice being given to you, you're having the choice being taken away in Dark Souls 2 in a sense, because before Scholars of the First Sin came out, you didn't have a choice in what ending you get. Where Nishandra specifically says in her dialogue, you must make the choice. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. like, you just locked me in a room, no pizza, no nothing, and decided that I should just be okay with this. Yeah, exactly. And like, I, I have a lot of thoughts about Dark Souls 2. I know that it went through like weird development hell and it got passed off between multiple people. Um, I've heard, you know, various things from various people that were internal on that project and um there's like a lot of stuff that i can't talk about but there there's a lot of love that i have towards some of the side characters and some of the writing but there's also a lot of stuff that i feel like i i feel like i have enough context to understand like what stuff is relevant and what stuff is um more like fluff or more like you know um say when the cycle ends in dark souls 2 and then we get dark souls 3 what kind of stuff is going to be like irrelevant like what kind of stuff disappears when that age ends so like the fluff and like all those societies and all the like kind of they're like important npcs but they're relatively irrelevant you know um all of those people are going to die and then this new era comes it, it becomes like easier the more you go through the games to understand like i guess like which stuff is going going to cease you know if that makes yeah, sense. Exactly. And that's one thing that I was actually curious about when it comes to NPCs and when it comes to different characters in the first three Dark Souls games, who do you think are the most prevalent to keep within the storyline? Oh, man. Okay. So the archetypes, the archetypes and like the, the, I guess, like tropes that I think are the most important. Um, I'm actually like starting a new series on breaking down symbols across the games. And I think that the symbols and how they tie into the NPCs are kind of like what makes those NPCs important. So all of the Chaos Witches and the Swamp Folk are incredibly important. And this includes Melania as well. But anybody that dictates the concept of like rot, decay, death, and then how that trans, like how we transfer heat post mortem into like other things. Um, What's his name? Laurentius? I think is his name. Is that his name? <laughs> Laurentius. I'm really bad with this man's name. Um, but I love him very much. He's the pyromancer teacher 
in Dark Souls 1. Um, I know which one you're talking about, yep. Hold on, let me double check. Yeah, Laurentius of the Great Swamp. He has this, like, really beautiful dialogue that I think about. I think about it all the time, especially as it pertains to, like, Melania's. I know a lot of people, um, we, I've gotten in, like, conversations with people in my community about Scarlet Rot and whether or not it is something that is beneficial, like, at all. Because obviously, like, mushrooms and rot and decay break down organic matter that could potentially, like, be harmful to just leave. Um, if if organic matter was just immortal forever and, like, didn't go anywhere, we would just live in a world full of, like, dead, decaying. But it wouldn't decay. It would just sit there. You know what I mean? Like, it wouldn't... Um, but, that was actually another question I wanted to ask you because I know some people have given you a little bit of shit for your theories on like the mushrooms and everything. And yeah. I was like, what's, I, I need to know about the mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hold on, let me pull up the dialogue. There's this like really beautiful dialogue that kind of, um, let's see if I can find it. Okay, yeah. So um, Pyromancy is the art of casting fire, produce flame, then channel it, just as our ancestors did. A pyromancer must be in tune with nature herself. My home, the Great Swamp, is an abundant store of nature. You'll understand one day, it only takes time. Um, it's got a rather primitive aspect to it. It meshes poorly with advanced, advanced cultures. Um, but there's this idea of, like, everything that's down in Blight Town and everything that's down in the Undercities is, like, all this, like decaying filth and decaying matter and that's like something that he iterated on from the valley of defilement and demon souls which was like a place where they used to throw like dead bodies and like waste and so all of the people who were impoverished had to like live in it in the valley of defilement but miyazaki takes it one step further and makes it a store of power because like i said the release of heat of decaying matter it becomes kind of like this this store but then um we also have like the whole isolith and the chaos which is attempting to recreate the first flame um and like yes. not yeah. containing it um and then it becoming like the demonic plague so that gets kind of iterated on from demon souls which is really cool i i like that story a lot i, I like to say that yuria in demon souls was like the prototype chaos witch because she talks about how her sorceries <laughs> are, are different than sage freak um but she gets into that and she talks Which, about it very similar. It kind of goes into what I think about Dark Souls 2 as well, because yeah. the the witch, uh, she had two or three daughters, two daughters, three daughters. Mm -hmm. I think she had two, two or three daughters, which one of them becomes a lost center. And that was the theory I had for a very long time of where she's basically the one that we're fighting up against as basically like the true testament to where the lore theories go in Dark Souls 2 and how beautifully they connect in Dark Souls 1. Because so many people say that, oh, there's no story in Dark Souls 2. Yes, there is. There's yeah. a bountiful amount of story. Um, when you well, meet like even the boss that is in the um, the pirate ship. I, I don't remember the name yeah. of that place, but it's just in the pirate ship that literally connects to what the um, the moves for the dance for the Boreal Valley would be in Dark Souls 3. Yeah, the, the sentry, the dual sentry or whatever. Um, the, uh, the, oh my gosh, you, you said something earlier before we were talking about the sentry. We were talking about that I wanted to say, oh, the Lost Center. The bug that crawls into the Lost Center's face is the same bug model that is Lost Isolith's model. So, like, she's the bug at the base. We, me and Loki were talking about this recently because there was some, like, mistranslation um, around her boss design. But the two sides on either side are supposed to represent two different daughters. So it was presumably Isolith and, like, a couple daughters that get turned into the Bed of Chaos collectively, as opposed to it just being Isolith by herself so it was that was like a cool little <laughs> fact that he hit me with <laughs> i absolutely love it though because it's just like so many of the arguments that i've had with people revolved around like the story of what dark souls is because story for me is the most important thing about a video game and with mm -hmm. dark souls one two and three they've collectively merged to a degree of where you have such a smooth transition between each game that by the third game you're literally fighting at the end a bonfire itself 
Mm-hmm. And I think that is probably one of the coolest things ever. That's also something I want to go into a bit of where you think the personification of the bonfire is something that could lead into what we might see in the DLC, a personification of what grace might be, for example. I, it's really interesting that you say that because I, I do feel like Miyazaki's iterated on the world tree, but there's definitely some George R. R. Martin stuff going on with like, there's there's a Germanic creative myth about blacksmithing. Um, and there's also like a, I know Dare Ring was based off of it. Um, and also Lord of the Rings was like loosely based off of that. <laughs> um, so there's like some symbolism, some like spiritual or mythological symbolism that has to do with like a creation myth regarding a forge and regarding rings. And Miyazaki said that like the rings themselves act as like laws for the universe within that. So you're, you kind of have like a tree and then symbolically the tree is like representative of like the fabric of that world's reality also sorry my dog is banging on the door apologies <laughs> um so like, the tree ahead. yeah he's like i need to eat some french fries please um i so we have the tree that is like kabbalah tree and also uh yggdrasil it's pretty much just like the fabric of reality for this 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 like world this bubble that we're existing in right um and so we have this tree but then we have the written laws that are inside of the tree that dictate then what happens outside of the tree so we were talking about it like code like if somebody wrote a code and you can like change it you can amend it and then you hit run and it has like a function and then it spits it out into the universe and it changes the way that the universe acts or you know doesn't act so like marco was able to delete dust and death to like remove it from the code and then hit run and then now we have all these issues with you know the way that rebirth happens and the way that death is processed and all this other stuff so it's it's a little bit different i feel like gwyn and like the first flame and all that stuff was was more broad it wasn't as nuanced it was just like fire represents like kind of like consciousness awareness it represents like you know um ambition it represents like kind of recorded history and then in elden ring it's quite literally letters it's quite literally like actually written word um it's like runes that we collect like runes are just like a series of letters like we're collecting letters we're collecting words so think of it from that perspective (laughs) yeah so it's like it's it's very it's a lot more pointed than i think like the first flame and like the kiln of the first flame is because like the kiln a kiln is somewhere where you like you make pottery and then you put it in there to dry so you have like a cre- you're creating something and then it like gets uh it like settles and you create something it spits it out and then you have like a pot you glaze it in the kiln and then you take it out um but in this one it's almost like it's so much more nuanced there's a lot more implication there with like law and spirituality and written word and early history and like all this other stuff that's being referenced mm-hmm. i think it's, yeah, it's- it's really interesting because uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people are going to watch this podcast and they'll be like, wow, I didn't think there was a story to any of this. And it's like, yeah, there's a pretty intensive story when it comes to the, you know, souls, souls like <laughs> souls born, a lot of it. Um, there is one question that I asked Elbithium whenever he came onto the podcast that I'm going to ask you. And I think I might make it like a steady thing as I go for each person who I interview. So you're having a pizza party. And we're getting into like more of the fun part of the podcast right now. Even though lore is, lore is fun, but this is like taking it to like a chaotic level. Um, yeah. We have a pizza party, right? Who is the Who are the people that you're going to be inviting? Who are the bosses that you are going to invite from oh. each soul is this, or soul's is this, Oh, I was going to say, is this just Elden Ring or is this like ev- no, anybody? No, it could be like from Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Elden oh Ring, God. Demon Souls. <laughs> oh, that's, I almost feel like that's so many. Um... <laughs> And you have to answer, like, what what kind of pizza are you going to have? I mean, you know, you have to have the pizza. I mean, we're just going to, so, like, I have, I have, I have my own preference with pizza, but I, if I'm inviting a bunch of random people that I don't know, we're going, we're going with a cheese pizza. We're just going with a plain, just like a plain classic. So that way people don't argue <laughs> because I feel like everybody that I'm going to invite would absolutely like murder each other. But I definitely would have Selene. She would be there. She's like so inflammatory. Everybody hates her. <laughs> I love that woman so much. Maybe I mean, like, I could just invite all the heretical witches. I could. It could be oh like my God. it could be Uria, I mean, Selene, Isolith, um, 
you know, like all of the heretical witches I I would love to have a pizza party with, but I'd love so but I think Elden Ring, if I just isolate it down to Elden Ring, I'd love to have Gowry, um uh Bogart, the the prawn shrimp man. Oh my god, um, I remember that. <laughs> I'd love to have uh Selene, I'd love to have an alabaster lord, and um I'd love to have let me think. Latena, maybe? Just because oh, okay. she's cool. Yeah, she's she's just chill. some solid choices. Yeah, yeah. But I feel like Gowrie feel- and Selene would go off. I would sit there and listen to them for forever. Just the drama and the tea between <laughs> those two. Honestly, I feel like the, the party crasher might be Radon. Just- oh, yeah, for sure. Radon would, would yeah. totally ruin everything. But there's an alabaster lord there for good measure. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> Honestly, if I'm going to invite people, the, 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 I would get two pizzas because my favorite is broccoli and uh, mushroom. So I would oh, get yeah. that and then just a plain one because it's just like, you're you're right. Like there's too much arguing that goes on. It's just like you need to have some sort of middle ground there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if I'm going to invite anybody, it's going to be the dancer of the Boreal Valley from Dark Souls 3. Oh, because yeah. She slices up the pizza so easily with those moves, oh, though. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> then I would probably invite the hunter, you know, make sure everybody's safe. And I would, and, oh gosh, absolutely invite Artorius because, you know, my favorite, I have to. Um, who else am I going to invite? I think I yeah. might. Ooh, Giza has a pizza cutter. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true, actually. The wheel. I forgot about that. Like, I forgot about him too until just now. Like, oh, God. hello? Some- some cosplayer actually needs to make a life-size version of that and bring it to said pizza party. Oh, please, please. <laughs> that would be amazing. Anybody in the comments who's a professional cosplayer, please make that. That would be yeah. amazing. Um, I think the other one who I would invite, oh gosh, it would be the sulky guy in Firelink Shrine who you meet right when you enter oh, into yeah. the game. The, all the crestfallen warriors. That would yes. be a really fun pizza party to get all of them in a room. <laughs> just be like a Doomer convention. Oh, gosh. That, that would just be them just talking about how they didn't become Elden Lord. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the last one I would invite would be Nishandra because I feel like she would be ca- like respectfully late, but coming in with a lot of style. Diva. Absolute diva. diva. You know what? I would invite her, too. She's like so she's such a mess. She's such a mess. And I love it. I love it. She's so dramatic. <laughs> She's such a mess, quote unquote, quote, 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 like 2024. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, she's like in a, sh- she's in a marriage. So that way she can like just topple everything over. And then she's just like a nightmare. And I love her. I love yeah, her. And no, she looks great. She looks great doing it. Well, that's the thing. Like when I first saw her dialogue, she was so like abrasive and pessimistic. You can't help but to love the attitude whenever she knows that she's the shit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Oh my God. So I feel like our pizza parties are going to be absolutely chaos, but it'll be okay. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so the other thing that I wanted to go into really quickly before we end things off is your experience with the Souls games. Now, as far back as I've seen your YouTube channel, some of the first videos that you ever posted were, uh, were on Demon Souls lore and you playing Demon Souls and Bloodborne <laughs> and everything. Is a lot of that revolved around like how you started stuff or where did you start your Souls journey? So I actually was like very, very heavily into into mech games. And so I've always been a sci-fi fan- fantasy person, like always my whole life. My family is like my dad in particular is like very into sci-fi and fantasy. So I grew up with those two genres, just like like consuming anything and everything. But um, I actually started off playing Guard 1, which is not a FromSoft game. Obviously, that is Yoko Taro. And back in the day, it was Square Enix. But um, that game had weapon lore, and that was before Soulsborne games did this. Um, I want to say it was like like Kingsfield. I want to say it came before Drakengard one, and that Kingsfield had item lore, but it wasn't as like deep as Drakengard, where like every time you upgraded a weapon, you got a little bit more about that weapon, and so it was kind of like. It, it got me into reading items. So Yoko Taro instilled that in me. Thank you, Yoko Taro. Um, but he, uh, sorry, I then went on to um, play a lot of mech games because I love sci-fi. Um, and I was playing Last Raven when I was growing up. That was my first Armored Core game. And then I played 4 and it like changed, it like reinvigorated that relationship that I had with FromSoft games and also Tenchu Z, I think they had. Um so there was like a few FromSoft titles that I was already really like 
like married to, I think when I was younger, like I, I would play anything and anything and everything that came out under that umbrella. And then I heard that Demon Souls was coming out and that it was by the same guy who did Armored Core. And that it was also from Soft. And the aesthetics and the genre of it, like the dark fantasy, kind of almost like when you first get started, it's very low fantasy. It doesn't feel like when you think of high fantasy and you think of like World of Warcraft and all this like really ornate armor and like high magic and like it's really not that way. It's like you're kind of in the shit and the piss and like you're in the dirt and it's like you got a stick and <laughs> you know, like there's not, there's some magic and there's some eldritch uh, sorcery, but there's not a lot of like high, like Lord of the Rings, like elves magic until Dark Souls with Ulysseal, but there's not a lot of that stuff. And I think the low fantasy and the dark fantasy aesthetic really appealed to me at the time because at the time, like a lot of fantasy was very World of Warcraft coded, especially in the West. Um, like in the in the nineties and like two thousands, it was very like uh big pauldrons and like <laughs> That's big, true. big colorful armor, which is like awesome in its own right. But I, I think that like there was just something so like visually appealing about Demon Souls to me. And that what game, did you think about the remake then if you were a fan of the original? So, um, I have a really mixed relationship with the remake. I love the environmental designer. I think they did like a pretty fantastic job. Um, I know that a lot of people were complaining about like the color usage because it wasn't as like one note. Um, a lot of people liked that aesthetic of it being very kind of brown and greenish, but they definitely like inject it with a lot more color. Um, I did like that. I did not like the design changes of the shields and the armor. They changed, uh, they took artistic liberties with Selene's armor, which made me really angry because <laughs> that was my favorite armor set. It looks like um like a Hermes armor set. It's like got the golden um, helmet with like the little wings oh, on yeah. it. It's yeah. very um, androgynous. It's very like unisex, um, even though only females can wear it, which is bizarre. But like Hermes aesthetically invokes like a very traditionally like male um, appearance, but it's because she's a messenger and she's checking on her brother. And so you have this like story of Hermes, you know, like as a messenger for the gods. So we we kind of get like some cool visual like language and like philosophy that they're using. And then they like changed it to look almost like Wonder Woman armor, which it didn't it like I did not like the way they it just looks like weird. And then they also changed the witches set. The witches set used to just be like you look like a pine cone kind of and then, like it was very like not not form fitting and then they like changed it to be like busty witch like with a corset it it's was so weird that you say that because my that my only experience of demon souls is the remake i never played the original before oh my god hold on let me find um <laughs> gotta find this for you because it's so i played um for those of you that have played demon souls y'all know if you play a female character um because the the female armor is sorry the armor is gender locked for some armor sets and uh, I, I don't think that the Ragged set is gender locked. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, it is kind of like the best light armor early on, especially when you have a low. Oh, that looks um, so cool. Yeah. So it's like you're kind of like a big raggedy pine cone. Like you're a big. <laughs> I can see it now. <laughs> but then in, a, in, in the remake, it's like they give you tavern wench. They give you <laughs> like, I don't know what this. Cottage court. Sorry. Yeah, I don't. It could be cottage core. It kind of is like, ooh, um, like it's cool, but it's not fitting these. It's not fitting like the same kind of aesthetic. But the reason why that armor set is so like interesting to me is because um, Yuria, that witch, is like the chaos witch equivalent. Like she's like the Isolith equivalent. But um, <clears throat> the old one kind of has the same silhouette as like the body of that armor. Um, it kind of has like a Christmas tree type aesthetic that I feel like that was invoking. <gasps> the original armor set was kind of invoking. I didn't know that this was a character. When I first saw this in the game, I didn't... Oh, God, now I feel stupid. Okay, so it's interesting that you, that you bring this up right now because when I saw the ending of this, when I was doing my playthrough, I was like, oh, this is so aesthetically pleasing. It looks rather 
gorgeous. And I saw notes of Elden Ring with the Synology, if that's the correct term for it, and the way that certain things are are on top of the witch over here, like the circles with the like the the lines going straight through it. That is so Elden Ring. And I see where they're getting a lot of what their inspiration was for later games. I didn't know this was a yeah. witch. I thought this was just oh, something that you went inside. <laughs> yeah, so this is the old one. This is like the celestial being. And like before, hold on, let me get better concept art for you. Um, before he was like rendered into the game, the concept art shows him as a big celestial tree with like stars inside of him. So here's the concept art. So if you click on that, you can kind of see the detail of like the magic rippling off of him. And it looks very like starry night sky vibes um but yeah it's like uh it, it it isn't i wouldn't say it definitely is like the infancy of like the great tree right it's like the infancy of how miyazaki uses the tree as like the laws of reality because the old one is a being and like he stores a, a soul he has like a big soul inside of him and he can influence the fabric of reality in a lot of ways and the monumentals have to cut him off from the fabric of reality to prevent him from spreading but even after they cut him off, he's still able to spread. So there's like this weirdness about like faith and like spoken word and like religious or spiritual entities or demonic entities being able to like traverse these lands um, that kind of first start popping up in Demon Souls. And then it gets iterated on. It becomes like the kiln of the first flame in a giant tree. And then it becomes the Ur tree with the forge inside of it. It just kind of like keeps building and gets more sophisticated each time. Now I have That's to ask: cool. Did they have the same ending in the uh, in the original where you had the option to kill the uh, yeah. kill the, the starter? Okay, okay. Yeah. It's interesting that 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 they kept that, and it, it just kind of makes me a little bit bitter that they only had one fucking ending in Dark Souls Two, and it's just like that. That was the only part that really I I just did not like about the game was the ending, and it's yeah. so weird to me because in Demon Souls the ending was so philosophical and beautiful and so well rounded, and it just topped everything off very nicely. So when I did that ending, I didn't kill the um, the firekeeper. I just walked right out, and you see kind of like where the rest of the games are going to go, because I figured that Demon's Souls was more of a prequel to what the other games are, if that makes sense. Yeah, like, I definitely think that if we're looking at the game, like, like I I think that if you look at them, like, a multi-connected universe, um, you can say that Demon's Souls came before, for sure, like, and see it kind of, like, in that kind of a uh, Demon's Souls, Dark Souls, Elden Ring, like, in that order. Um, I I see it, because the way that I view it is different, where I view it as more like a loose motif that Miyazaki iterates on, as opposed to like a connected universe. But it's the same, the same way that I'm consuming it is also in that order, because as a game developer, he started off with a very simple idea on like an action fantasy game, and he's been like refining it and refining it and refining it. And he's, it's almost like he's getting closer and closer. He even said this in an interview that he's getting close to the game that he envisions is what he's trying to go for, if that makes sense. Like, and the way that he's doing that is that is by like reusing assets and reusing concepts and reusing things. So then that way it's less work to build it up from the ground up, if that makes sense. And then that way he can just continue adding more and more and more every time he iterates on it. Uh, so that way it's more of a, yeah, the players are going to get what the backstory is and where everything is rooted from. That makes complete yeah. sense. But yeah. Yeah. So we have um, like common themes like fire, chaos, uh, swamps, moon, sorcery, academia, faith, sun, like all those things are going to be the same in his games. Okay, yeah, and even rot as well. That's going to probably yeah. make it up as well. It's really fascinating, the whole rot concept, because I find it, it having to do, and this is actually something I'm going to touch on in a video I'm currently working on for religion in Souls games. And I want to, you know, just preface this by saying, um, while I am not religious, I find religion absolutely intriguing and fascinating. And it, especially in the world of Elden Ring and Dark Souls games, um, I consider Rot a religion in and of itself because you have this entire base, you have this entire motif of death being arisen again from what mm -hmm. the Rot is. So it'll be really interesting to dive into that. Um, you know, it, it's going to be a lot, a lot of work because I don't want to overlap any other theories that you know maybe Loki has done or anything like that. So um, my well, apologies, Loki, if I end up doing that. <laughs> I would, I would say that like um, 
if you want to get into like making Elden Ring or Dark Souls lore videos to like just just like consume the content how you do and then like create create things i think that the time like i, I actually got in a conversation about this in regard to plagiarism or borrowing ideas um because sometimes we borrow ideas and we don't even realize we're borrowing them or sometimes we'll see something or we'll hear something we, we're not quite sure where we heard it from um i make a point to like make notes of um, anybody who's informed me and I always like include them in my videos on like the little sticky notes and give people shout outs. Um, but for the most part, I almost always try to like isolate myself for like the first, <laughs> like, like, and I know Vati does this too, cause we both kind of will work in tandem with each other, but I won't hear from him until he's already like come to his conclusions about something. So like, we'll both say like a trailer will drop or like information will drop. We won't talk for a little bit. And then, like, a week or two later, like, he'll reach out or, like, I'll reach out and we'll be like, hey, what did you think? You know, like, like once we've already solidified and, like, made videos and done content, then it's kind of, like, I feel comfortable reaching out and feel yeah, like... Yeah, because that's the same thing in gaming journalism uh, to a degree of where, like, you don't want to discuss your review at all with another journalist because yeah. ideas leak into one another. And, it, yeah, it's I completely understand that completely. Mm -hmm. it's, it's That's where whenever I, I came up with the lore that I did, I, sometimes I don't realize that there's leakage from, like, Vati or Loki or anyone else that I hear. So especially with, with the Solaire thing, that was my first attempt besides Patches. Yeah of trying to yeah. do something with lore and i was so nervous to post that tweet and i was oh, just no. like hit send oh god here we go <laughs> no yeah like i feel like those are good things to wonder about because like the motif is still the same like dung eater if you read all of his stuff and you read solar stuff you can see the differences between them but like when you think about what the sun represents you're not you're not wrong like it's the same thing it's like f this idea of faith it's like this idea of like taking a step forward and and pursuing faith which like they both set out to do. Um, the Dung Eater has like a very tragic background and like there's, I, th I want to say there's something about, isn't it like there's kind of a reminder of like punishment? Um, yes, there is. Cause he said, you know, what was it? The blisters will boil or something as did it for me or something <laughs> like massively paraphrasing, but he wanted the same uh, torment onto other people as was done to him. Yeah. Wait, worn by the Dung Eater, the heavy sun-shaped medallion represents both the guidance he once saw in the ring to one day it will lead. So yeah, it's like, it's 100% like this idea of trying to find your son or like trying to find your faith. I know that like Loki, Loki has like a whole thing. I definitely want to recommend to like go check out um, his interpretations of it. I also have like my weird, all of the ruined stone fragments are used to create like glowstone items and like glowy items. And it talks about a sacred light that existed inside of the ruins and the ruins come from Faramazula. So there's a secret like sacred light that is inside of the ruins itself um and it can be broken down into rainbow colors just like the sunlight yeah. like just like the real <laughs> light so we have like a lot of ideas on what the sun realm could have been or where the sun could have gone or what could have happened but i'm curious to see if we're going to get any more information about that in the dlc too it's interesting you bring up the sun because i you know, part of me thinks that this all stems from Dark Souls 1, whenever we see that if we kill Guinevere, the sun goes away because it's all a facade. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I wonder if that is going to play a part in any of it of, you know, Miyazaki putting a little bit more of an emphasis on the sun is kind of what you make it and not to be confused or be blinded by what actually isn't there. Well, it's, it's interesting, too, because like a friend of mine, Ross and I want to I want to shout them out because like this is his theory but he's been looking into um enlightenment and like the sun and dragons because those things are commonly linked in the Soulsborne games um specifically in regard to enlightenment because a lot of the way of the dragon stuff is like symbolically mirrors like a lot of meditation practices especially like arch dragon peak and how to get there you have to meditate on a rock um and a lot of the meditative statues have turned to stone so it's like this idea of people meditating until they die or until they've like passed but it's it's weird that in like dark souls 3 there's no sun except on arch dragon peak like anytime you go to the dragon areas in the game the sun is always illuminated and it's there and it's fine and it's not it's like the only place consistently where there's sunlight um so i'm i'm kind of curious about 
you know, the way of the dragon and the sun and, and all this other stuff that Ross pointed out to me because I think it's like so super interesting compelling. interesting you say that because the only place that there was really consistently sun in Dark Souls 2 was where you had to get the misty ash from the dragon that was telepathically talking to you. Yeah, I think also, was was that the dragon that is like a giant too? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, that thing really- was massive. Yeah, like, well, it was like Aldia was doing like all this um, science to try to like recreate like an immortal era. So he was like trying to recreate everlasting dragons and he was trying to like do a bunch of, he was like a mad scientist trying to like create the first flame and like do a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, so it's kind of cool. Yeah, so to kind of close off the podcast, there's one more topic that I want to talk about. It doesn't, well, it does have to do with the gaming, but it's more or less what's going on in the community right now. Uh, Gamergate 2, because I know you have experience with this, with the working with companies and working with game companies in particular. Um, this entire thing that's going on with Sweet Baby right now is absolutely ridiculous. I'm seeing it all play out, and I haven't felt comfortable enough to talk about it until tonight because I was trying to gather my thoughts and everything to speak about it well-versed because I don't want to talk about something that I don't know about <laughs> that'll just make me look like an idiot. Um, yeah. So what are your thoughts on it? Because I have some... Thoughts of my own on this, but I want to reference you for uh, a bit before I go into yeah, it. Yeah, of course. I think a lot of the people that are arguing about um, consultation and like diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives are like incredibly misinformed on what the game development process even looks like. Um, a lot of people assume that what happens is that there is a game that is being created and initially everybody in it is like white and male and that a consultation company comes in and says change this character change this character change this character and that that therefore then leads to like a disjointed narrative also give me one second i'm gonna let my dog in real quick hold on a lot of folks assume that consultation companies come in and change the trajectory of the characters and the game and the writing and like all this other stuff and they'll they'll force uh diversity um you know, on a product or that they'll change a product or that they'll make the product worse by doing these like last minute changes in production. Um, but the the way as somebody that has worked in like the AAA game industry for about five years now, the way that it actually works is that um, designers and writers and developers will will come up with like a game loop or a game cycle. And then also a concept around like whatever they want the game to be about if there's like a narrative so um the games that i worked on were like ori will of the wisps and tell me why by don't nod studios and tell me why was one where we worked with a dei group um and there's actually like i was kind of worried to talk a little bit about um some of this before publicly but it turns out that they actually have like published a article publicly so I can talk about it so there's not like NDA hanging over my head thankfully um, so I'm going to be posting um, the article about it and the indigenous foundation that Don't Nod consulted with because the game's narrative includes um, indigenous cultures that are around Alaska so um, they wanted to make sure that they got like a lot of it takes place in like an old house in Alaska but there's also kind of like a um neighboring like grocery store and like a reservation and a couple of folks that are a part of like various different cultures there's also like a transgender character and so i think a lot of folks would immediately jump on like oh they're just kind of force feeding us this and it's like no this narrative is actually like about a real community in rural alaska that represents like what is happening there um, especially like, cause there's some socioeconomic stuff that is, that is happening that makes life quite hard for some of the folks that live out there. Um, and there's like a little bit of abuse and there's a lot of drama. Um, so for those of you that are unfamiliar with Don't Not, they, um, also before some of their team members worked on Tell Me Why, or wait, Tell Me Why is the game. They worked on, um, Life is Strange. They worked on Life is Strange. Um, yeah. So it's like the same kind of narrative storytelling game, but like, that is that is my example as to like this this like how development takes place. It's like okay, we want a narrative game, um, but then we want there to be some kind of like drama, and we want to investigate a particular idea or maybe like a particular lifestyle. Um, we want to focus on like Alaska. We want to focus on X, Y, and Z. Okay, but then how do we represent this in a way that's authentic to the people that are actually going through it? 
that's where the consulting company then comes in. The consulting company comes in after to just make sure that things are historically and socially accurate, not to push a narrative or push some kind of like weird representation on the production company. Um, so the DEI is just there to like help, like say for example, you know, your writing team is full of like a bunch of, you know, like, white, Asian, or like black folks, nobody's indigenous on your team, but you want to write about this. So how do you go about writing about it? Okay, you reach out to the um, indigenous foundation. Like, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. Like, if I'm writing, if I'm writing a, if I'm writing like me, like a white woman, I'm writing a black character because I want there to be a black character in my game, not because of any pressures or anything, but just because like, I have friends in my life that I want them to feel like they see themselves. I'll talk to them about their experiences. I'm not going to like make up their experiences. Why would I do that? Like that doesn't, that doesn't make, that doesn't make sense to me from like a creative perspective. And I think a lot of the conversation is just miss, totally misguided and like misses the intentions behind like why people write the things that they do. And like, I think also too, you know, with Stellar Blade coming out, there's a lot of conversation about um like this is what they're taking away from us, you know, like they're taking the they're taking the the t- the titties out, like they're taking <laughs> they're taking it away from us. But like that's I'm not sorry. even the case the either. You said that it made me laugh more than I should. Have. <laughs> that's not even the case either. Like nobody's taking those things away if anything like I don't know, man. Like everything is being what? added in. Like my whole theory on this entire thing it's a bit of a, a, a utopianist idea, but it, it's it's something where I try to remind people that human life is very unique, right? We have different kinds of people. There's black, there's white, the, you know, there's, there's heavily pigmented. There's people who have d- multitudes of different skin colors at once. If we're going to make gaming diversity better, why not include everything that the world already has? Yeah, exactly. You and know, I, like, I think it's, it's quite interesting too because like in the areas that are very tech dense and that are very just dense in general like major cities there is a large degree of diversity in those spaces so it makes sense that when we're writing about like a population or writing about a character that we will write about the things that we see so it makes sense that like a lot of the stuff that people who live in these major cities will write about are this diverse you know population of people whereas like you know the people that are getting upset about this are like you know, in really small rural communities that are like just surrounded by one type of person. And so they don't see the world that way. They see this reality as like a forced reality that's not real. And like, that's not true at all. Like as somebody that's lived in major cities my whole life, that's like, it's weird. Like uh, uh, occasionally I'll go down a hole where I'll watch the Vampire Diaries. Don't ask me why I do this. It's not. Same. (laughs) Okay, okay. I was gonna say, like, it's it's like the most cringe media, but like at the same time, I'm like, yeah. like I love it. It's, I eat that shit up. But like, it's the same watching thing with Pretty Little Liars, so I completely understand. Yeah. But then watching that as somebody who grew up in San Francisco my whole life, I am like, I everybody's so white. Everybody's so white. Like the whole cat. Everybody's white. There's one black character, but everybody is white in this show, or they're black. I grew up in a largely like like a uh, Filipino, Mexican and like Indian community, like, like nobody, nobody was white. <laughs> nobody. So it was, it was just like a very different experience. And so when I watch media like that, I'm like, this is a fake reality. Nobody lives <laughs> like this, but then it's, it's like, yes, they do in rural, like Massachusetts, they do. <laughs> or like, whatever. it's not representative of like what the actual general population, because I, I grew up partially in New Jersey and partially in Manhattan. And Manhattan is kind of like a gumbo of all of the different cultures. And it's just, it, it's beautiful. And then when I watch Pretty Little Liars, I'm like, this isn't reality. <laughs> no, it's not real. There's no way. There's no way that a place like this exists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, it's so mind boggling to me because I see the conversation online and I just want to bring attention to a lot of the harassment that my fellow journalists and developers are getting right now. You guys can disagree, and I'm going to look straight in the camera for this one because I'm looking at you, but I want to look straight in the camera for this one. You guys can disagree. You guys have the right to disagree. You guys have the right to question in a respectful way 
but do not ever send people death threats or make them feel uncomfortable in a work area. Because keep in mind, uh, you know, I'm a journalist, you know, Quilag, you're a YouTuber, you work with companies, you work with, you've worked with Xbox. So you're in the gaming community. Like there are so many other people who I've been able to have the, the privilege and like just, I don't mean to go over like overboard, but the honor to get to talk with and be able to converse with. And we can disagree with one another. We can do that. That's absolutely fine. But when it comes to death threats, when it comes to harassment, when it comes to sending emails, please do not do that. Yeah, I think so. I think the issues that folks are having to where if they are playing a game and it does feel disjointed or it does feel odd or it does feel kind of like wrong and it's legitimate criticism and it's getting misguided. Um, there was a really great document documentary that GameSpot did on Cyberpunk's agile strike teams and the way that AAA game development can go like horribly wrong and cause a lot of bugs and cause a lot of issues in development. And a lot of it doesn't have to do with finances being displaced into DEI. Most of it has to do with the internal infrastructure and how certain teams are siloed from one another. So if you're working in a AAA game setting and you have artists, designers, and programmers, and they're all separated into those three groups away from each other, they then can't see how all of the elements intermingle and play with each other once the product is shipped. Um, so it causes this like, it causes bugs, it causes like weird stuff, like my favorite example of this, um, and this is like definitely a UX pet peeve of mine, is when an NPC walks at a walk speed that the player character is not walking at. Like, so in Bethesda games, when you have a character, like at the start of uh, Starfield, when you have like a character who's walking this like mid walk speed, you kind of have to like, <laughs> you have to find like a sweet spot on your controller to get your character <laughs> to walk at the same speed. <laughs> like a lot of that has to do with the fact that like the UX team is like getting their hands on the game late in development or, you know, like it, a lot of, there's a lot of like exchanging hands and then a lot of things like I once again, I don't want to speak too much or break NDA, but there were times where um, on UX design we would get things literally ad as they were getting developed. We were like, like obviously that that makes sense because that's how that's how like QA and game development and like so QA and like UX are two different things, but that's how it works. Like you get a game build, QA is testing it, and as QA is testing it, the game developers are still developing. They're still working, you know. It, like it doesn't stop like production doesn't cease they just keep going and then like notes get sent up and then things get changed or altered but so it's like a filter of where goes what at what time okay yeah and then it gets transferred from qa to ux which is a totally different team and then like the build by that point might be like too old or like obsolete or there might be changes that are done to it so there there's just like and and that is that is like one way that it can go down. That's like one of the ways that it can go down. There can be like a million different ways that de that developers or that studios go about producing their game. So it's not just limited to my experience, obviously. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of ways for things to just go wrong. Um, but I'm gonna link you that um, in case you want to like link that um, as well. The um, interview with. CD Projekt Red about how they fixed Cyberpunk post-launch and like how their expansions since that launch and like the DLC is like critically acclaimed now. It's like awesome, but kind of like the production nightmares um, and how, uh, you know, AAA game industry can like really crumble <laughs> if, if it's not managed correctly. This is why I have a pet peeve with people calling developers lazy because it has nothing to do with laziness. It all has to do of what things are sent where at what time. It's just, it's games are massive. Like they, we, I don't think a lot of people realize how long it takes to make a video game and how long actually all of production takes and how everything is kind of like a ballet. It, it goes interwoven with everything like a dance and everything, especially if there's like a really harsh deadline, there has to be like some sort sort of balance that occurs there. Like the only thing that I have referenced as was working as like in an indie studio. AAA games are another beast entirely. And I cannot imagine how much work goes into being at a AAA game studio. Yeah. I'll also send, this is like, sorry, I'm like 
sending like tons of material so that way people that are curious about this and like actually care about this discourse can then like break down their understanding of it and really learn about like the challenges that happen within this industry because it's a lot more complex than I think folks even realize. Um, there's this guy, Sergi, um, on, I know this is like really boomer of me to say, but he's on LinkedIn. Oh, nice. <laughs> My LinkedIn socials. <laughs> um, he made this really awesome um, spreadsheet of what a AAA game company like oh team gosh. looks like and he breaks it down based this. on like production operation and administration and it's fucked like it's there's so much and like this isn't just one person per thing this is like literally if you go to game design and say you go to the ux that's like 20 or 30 people that are in that bucket it's not just like oh this this is like one person per category no no <laughs> no this is like 20 to 30 oh people gosh. per you know per section which is like <sighs> you can imagine how difficult it is to have that many people cohesively work on something it's it's mind-boggling to me and i want just people to understand like if you gen and this is gonna sound kind of like you know pissy of me to say but if you genuinely care about games you'll read the stuff because a lot of people, you know, make kind of the bold claim that, oh, you know, it why is it taking this long to put out a game? Why is it taking this long to put out a game? Bitch, it takes time. Like, that's literally all I can say is like, it takes time. It yep. takes resources. It takes uh, PR doing their job. It takes the upper management doing their job, shareholders. A lot of people go into the flow of what makes a game a game. And you know, even that $5 game that someone bought on a Steam sale, that took probably years and years to make with everything combined. And it's so, this entire thing is just fascinating to me. So yeah, for those of you who want to learn more, who want to be able to do your research before talking about things that you have no idea what you're talking about, please click on these links down in the description below. It will help you guys immensely with understanding the current climate and what's going on in game development right now. Um, but yeah, it's... I, I also want to say, um, sorry to like, I know that we're trying to close out the podcast, but um, I have another pet peeve too, where like when I was talking about CD Projekt Red in isolation with their um, like shift internally, a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to buy unfinished projects because I don't want to support this trend in the game industry. But they don't realize that each individual team, each individual studio and each individual like person is like, not representative of the industry as a whole because everything is a lot more disconnected than it than i think people assume like people assume like if i don't support this one studio it will make a change within the industry as a whole and that that isn't true especially with global studios we have a lot of different studios across the world cd project red is in poland for example and um you know we have like united states based ones we have uh um, you know, Japanese game studios. And depending on the economic situation for each studio, it can be like vastly different on whether or not you boycotting them makes a difference. Um, some creative projects are actually funded by the government in certain countries. So that's something to consider. It's not all consumer based um, like it is in America, which, you know, you could even make the argument that that always doesn't, that sometimes might not change things um, if boycotts aren't organized well enough. But yeah, it's like, it's a whole ass, it's a whole ass economic can of worms that it's, I can get into. <laughs> it's a mess sometimes. And I feel like the baseline message that I feel like, you know, you want to get out to people. And I know that I want to get out to people's for people. I know I'm going to throw an F bomb in here, but people just need to do their fucking research. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it, it's really frustrating that people make these like really broad generalizations and don't actually understand what it looks like on the industry side. But not only that, but like talk down to people within the industry that they could be learning from as opposed to like trying to hear them. I think that's the big thing is that like a lot of folks and this even goes like in terms of uh, people that are um, yelling about DEI and stuff. It's like they're not taking a minute to consider other people's feelings that ac that it actually like includes. You know, they're not taking a minute to think outside themselves. They're just thinking about themselves and what they want in that moment. Exactly. And I feel like that's, like, it's, it's the biggest takeaway. If you guys just listen to anything that we've said in this podcast, please just understand that instead of assuming, just ask. You know, mm -hmm. we're always happy to answer. We're always happy to just, you know, 
educate. While we are not Google in the same token, we are always happy to answer questions that pertain to what you want to learn about, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that's the biggest thing, you know, and I think that for me, like when I started to get into the industry, I don't know if you had the same issue of where everything was thrown at you at once and you had to digest things rather quickly. Oh, so yeah. that didn't give a lot of room for like, oh, no. I need to learn about this. I need to learn about that. But also at the same time, I need to do this. <laughs> There's no such thing as onboarding and creative spaces. I've gotten used to that at this point. I'm like year five. Um, I've kind of like, I've been on a bunch of different teams, like, or I've rather I've worked with a ton of different studios and every studio is different. Some have like immense documentation. Like when I joined Xbox on a certain team, I got a documentation stack that was this thick. And when I joined a different team, as like a more senior role there was like nothing they had they literally didn't have any onboarding material for me i didn't know how to get set up i didn't know where i was supposed to go and that's within the same company that's both times at xbox yeah so it really does depend on the manager it does depend on like what your team is trying to accomplish but yeah it's like you can work for one manager and it's like a totally different experience within the same company. It's crazy. It's, it's absolutely Gosh. nuts. Man, you know, and with the, in all that chaos, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't trade anything what I do for the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I agree with that. So one last question I want to ask you before we go, I feel like it's a fitting thing to leave on. What is your favorite Souls game? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, okay. Can I, I have like a top a top five <laughs> even Absolutely. though that's like most of the games okay wait so i have like a, a a couple of them that are like my favorite for different reasons i would say all up if i'm like needing to get when we were talking earlier before the podcast we were talking about this idea of like a sense of home like this feeling of like home like you're going home like you've ex you've spent so many hours in a video game that it feels like a familiar like actual physical place that you go to like a library or a cafe or something i have that relationship with demon souls demon souls is like literally like my hometown it feels like in a way um no matter where i've moved because i've had to relocate a lot i've had to move a lot um that's just like the nature of working in the industry and it sucks and it's lonely and it makes you feel like you can't settle down and like make friends that like you know having my final fantasy free company and then having demon souls feels like home to me it feels like my space that i can like go to and like revisit anytime that i'm feeling like homesick for like a home that i don't have if that makes sense um yeah but like demon soul boletaria king duran is my king that's my king he's my king king gwyn can get out of here <laughs> duran duran didn't want to extend his age he just wanted to be like like a cool old man in a mausoleum and like that's i love that for him he's great he's my he's my favorite um i i think bloodborne i love the most for the story and like the setting i also think it did the most for the games as a whole historically because like miyazaki really started to get into using those historical assets really heavily in bloodborne i feel like bloodborne really changed the game in terms of miyazaki's storytelling with like outer gods as well um really like amplified that which was cool um i love i love sekiro for like the tightness of the combat there's nothing else like it it's unlike any other game that i've ever experienced um and i would say armored core 6 is also up there for me i have like i have that's also home i think like being in a mech also feels like home i would say i would say demon souls and armor core armor core 4 and armor core 6 that's like my that's my roman empire <laughs> Those are my, those are my my favorites. But I I think Elden Ring is slowly like catching up and kind of like eclipsing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> they're just chasing one another. Be like, go oh, there. Yeah, no. Somebody just came home, so the, they're just like. Bleh. Um, but no, I would say uh, Elden Ring is slowly eclipsing, uh, Demon Souls for me, which is like I never thought that would happen because like Dark Souls one came out, Dark Souls two came out, Dark Souls three came out, Bloodborne came out, and I was like, Demon Souls for life. And now that Elden Ring's been out for a minute, I'm like, oh shit! Like I think I really love this game a lot. Like I think this might be up there for me. <laughs> it's definitely one of my cozy games. I know a lot of people argue with me about like it's not a cozy game. It's a cozy game for me. <laughs> it's a cottage core bitch game for sure. No, one hundred percent. Like I'm out. I'm out here. Everybody's like. 
Oh my god, I I've actually talked to my partner a ton about this because I I love Animal Crossing content creators. I'm like addicted to Animal Crossing and Stardew Valley. I'm like I love uh there's that whole like cozy game movement, but like uh there's another content creator Nimbly. I don't know if you know her, but she's also um she does like cozy content, but she's also like a hardcore souls person and she's like very much like of the fae. Like very like fairy like dancer of the boreal valley coated like light blues and pastels and it's like that shit is in the souls games come on that that shit is there like you give a girl the great sort of moonlight and she's like thriving it's fine <laughs> i love it okay. though you know it's it's just a whole relaxing vibe i mean you know you die over and over again but it's fine <laughs> i want to pick berries in altus plateau okay i want to live in the um the celebrant cottages and have my little flower crown and like do a little dance and it's whatever and then just have you know just have what was it what's her name again the 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 teacher who has kids who throws books at you be your teacher oh yeah Renala. Renala, Renala. yeah yeah i literally when i saw that for the first time i was like is this a boss battle just little crotch goblins throwing books at me that's fine yeah no uh, oh my god i love how that's like the only boss that we never actually like beat either because like no we don't yeah ronnie steps in and like does the illusion and we see like how she used to be like, this is how my mom used to be. She was cool. And then she, like, goes back to being, like, I'm brokenhearted and <laughs> I'm crying. I'm crying in my library. Honestly, like, mood, I girl. feel for her. <laughs> yes, <laughs> mood, mood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's just there holding on to her baby. And then it's, like, anytime we respect, it's, like, I feel bad leaving you. Where are you? Yeah. Like, you're just a mess right now. I'm sorry. She, she needs a blankie <laughs> and, like, lots of, like, tea and, like, cookies and stuff. Blue, what was it that blue pea tea that's popular right now with matcha? Oh, yeah, to match the aesthetic, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. 100%. <laughs> oh, but I have to say, for me, my I think I would have to do a top three because Bloodborne is number one, and mm -hmm. then Dark Souls Remastered because that was the first Souls game I ever played. But it, I had my clicking moments at what was it, uh, in Orlando, where you see Smo and Ornstein. And yeah. it took me a few days to beat them. And I was like, wait, I feel invincible right now. They're definitely, so. the, uh, they're definitely like the skill check. There's always like skill check walls where it's like, or bosses where it's like, do you know how to par parry? I, I would say in um, Sekiro, there's the Makiri counter spear guy where he's like, you have to press B every time he does the thrust. He was like the, do you know how to do this yet? Like, do you know how to Makiri counter? Like, let me, let me. You better you better learn how because I'm going to teach you right now. It's great. Yeah, it, it it made me just realize that I never want to see a shit flinging monkey ever in my mm -hmm. real life ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think what was it? Ishin Sword Saints. That boss was just absolutely hell, but it was probably one of the best fights I've ever seen in a video game. Six day long DDR session is how it felt like. <laughs> it was just like memorizing memorizing uh movement patterns and like yeah. It was it was crazy. It's um, what was the third one? I would have to say Dark Souls three would be my third one, just simply because Dance yeah, through the Boreal Valley, but also the linear aspect in which that game was tackled. Like you had to go through and you had to get each of the ones in order to proceed. And just seeing like a personified bonfire that was just dope for me. I absolutely mm -hmm. loved that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. But yeah, I think honestly, you guys, this is probably one of the best Souls conversations I've oh. had in a very long time. Like, okay, listen, if Fighting Cowboy is watching, yes, our Souls conversations are awesome. But this was great because it was more lore. Well, Fighting Cowboy is the best too. I love, yeah. I love his okay. uh, his builds, and I use them all the time. Like he's he's goaded for sure. The Ungabungas. <laughs> I know that we I know that we disagree on whether or not Armor Core is from Soft. I think I think aesthetically, it is not. But I still stand by my um. Armored Core was the prototype for Demon Souls, like all the way. I'll I'll take that to my grave, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, and I just want to say, like, honestly, it, it's really interesting um, that I have to give a big shout out to the community for Dark Souls as well, because ever since I switched over my niche last year entirely to just doing game reviews and Souls and Souls like content, everybody has been so welcoming. <laughs> It's been yeah. really nice to see, um, you know, especially taking on like not doing variety anymore. So I just want to say thank you guys for being so welcoming and just understanding that my heart and soul lie with souls and souls like games. Yeah. And like there, there's always going to be like gremlins in the wall. I actually have been like going on like a spiral about it lately on my Twitch and then like on my YouTube. But that's just like YouTube comments, I think, and by nature, everybody that shows up to like my lives and then shows up to Twitch 
are like the nicest fucking people you'll ever meet. I think that there's like that shared struggle that resonates with a lot of folks in regards to the Souls games. Like a lot of people really like that oppressive atmosphere, that feeling of like, despite, you know, despite really awful circumstances, I can still feel like accomplished and, and, you know, strong and with it. Or, you know, fully, you could be fully nihilistic about it and be like a death cultist like I am in those games. But, you know, like, I feel like it's good company. Everybody's good company in the community and it's awesome. It really is. It's it's amazing. And, you know, it was really cool whenever, like, I, I fully went into Demon Souls for the first time and I did a playthrough of it. And I was like, man, I feel like I should just switch my niche over entirely. And I fully did it. And people were so welcoming, so happy. And it was from then on out, I fully embraced my masochism, bloodborne, blood built self. So it's well, great. welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, yeah. you know, you guys, if you want to check out Kulag, if I'm mispronouncing that, by the way, tell me and just say, it's, no, it's this way. I think. I think it's I think it's Quaylog, but honestly, that's like I don't know. <laughs> I've always said like I don't know how to say Ornstein and Smo. Is it Smoff? Is it Smo? Sm I Smo? I don't know because there's there's Smo there's Smo Town, but like I think in in like uh uh what's his name Vincent Van Gogh? It's like Van Gogh. Van there's like <laughs> there's like a weird like that actually. There's, the G H makes like a a different sound. Correct me so if I'm wrong smog. in the comments. Interesting. Hold on. Hold on. I have to Hold think on. about that too, because it's just like, I ne that's such an interesting way of pronouncing that smog. Because I feel like <laughs> Smogtown, shout out to Smogtown. Uh, they're like the homie. I love Smogtown. Don't know how to fucking pronounce it. Is a boss in the game series. Don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Um, it could just for abbreviated purposes, it just be, you know, come here, smoggy, you know? <laughs> okay, wait, how to pronounce, how to pronounce go, is it pronounced go or goff? Go is in America. Goff is French. Oh, interesting. Oh, wait, no, 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 wait, wait. English people say goff mm. and the French say gog. G smog? <laughs> smog? Smoff? Goff? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. You can't ask me it's, anything. I actually it's like don't learning really... words for the first time. <laughs> yeah, I like well, in my history videos. I accidentally said Celtic a couple times. I accidentally said that when I was referring to like the Celtic cross and like referring to like Celtic culture. I accidentally said Celtic. Throw me in a trash fire. I don't know how to pronounce anything, and like being American makes it worse because we just like pronounce things like shit. <laughs> Or like we honestly, <laughs> or we like fucking have like Boston Celtics. Why? Why was it not ever Celtics? What is happening there? And it's awful. And like so much of Elden Ring is steeped in fucking Latin and like early Greek. And I'm just like, bitch, I don't know what the fuck. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't. I know where it's coming from, but like, I don't. Like Hermes Trismegistus. Like, am I saying Trismegistus right? I don't fucking know. It's it's so weird. Like my brain will just go and I'll see a G in there and I'll say a J for some reason and it yeah. just makes my brain go fucking yep. lopsided. It's you awful. guys and this is you see, this is the chaos I was talking about, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's awful. You, you, you guys, it has been an absolute pleasure having Quilag here with us today, talking about it's lore, sweet. talking about Gamergate two point fucking oh, which will never cease to be. Yeah, there's always gonna be Entitled, entitled 12 year olds who just like don't don't understand anything and, and don't want to ask questions because their ego is too big to even be like me ask questions how dare you me actually listen to somebody else's experience i don't i don't know about that yeah no, i don't know about that that's <laughs> It's absolutely wild. But you guys, yeah. if you all like our faces and what we do, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell down below. I make videos every weekday here on YouTube. May you find your worth in the waking world, dear hunter. Stay casually nerdy, and I will see you all in the next video. Umbasa. Bye.